So welcome to our panel, uh, new research on book reviews. We have a pithy pre-title that was cut, uh, reception uh, in multiple dimensions, colon. <laughs> cut for time. Um, if you can't see the slides, uh, I would just invite you to move forward because there's so much space. And uh, I will be, we have uh, four papers today. I'm very excited for our offering. And uh, uh, my name is Matt Laven. I put this together and uh, with a group of people who we've presented together before. We have uh, four papers, myself, and then two participating remotely, and then a fourth paper. Uh, I'm not gonna do lengthy introductions. I'll let uh, people introduce themselves. Um, and I've already introduced myself. So in the interest of time, since we have four, uh, I am gonna get started pretty quick here, but I'm just gonna mention uh, that after each paper, I'm gonna do a very brief Q&A for like technical clarification type questions, and then hopefully have uh, a decent amount of time at the very end for questions for any panelist, including our online. They are uh, uh, intended to be in our online space, and I will play the role of uh, reading what's written in the chat. And if you want to ask something for our remote panelists, you should be able to use a microphone, and then they should be able to write their response in the chat, and then I'll read it. So we'll see how this goes, but we're all making this up as we go along. So uh, our first speaker needs no introduction because he is me, and I already did it. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this idea of worth by association in U.S. book reviews 1905 to 1925. Let's see if I can get this to work. So I started with a research question about how content in periodicals about specific authors, texts, and publishers, this thing that I call book talk, uh, how does it shape or mediate literary taste? And that led me to the secondary question or more specific question of what we can learn about this topic by looking closely at early 20th century US reviews. And in particular, I wanted to look at the dominant category terms favored by these book reviews and whether the norms for these category terms seem to change between 1905 and 1925. My research design started with uh, 10 periodical titles from the American Periodical Series, which is a ProQuest database. 1905 to 1925 for reasons that I can talk about more in Q&A. Uh, a sample of 6,930 articles that are tagged as reviews in that data set, and uh, an additional uh, control of capping the sample size per year at 330 reviews so that no one year in the data set uh, dominated the trend. And then I excluded uh, reviews in these very narrow trade journals uh, as well as religious periodicals for, again, reasons I can talk about later, uh, as well as reviews that are shorter than 300 words because of the text analysis implications. Uh, lastly, I divided that sample of 6,930 into an exploratory and a comparison subset. This is just a list of the actual periodical titles, the full print run of that title, and the number of reviews that are in the sample, with the idea being that yes, there are some here that have many more than others, but that there's no one uh, periodical title that has so many that it's representing a, a uh, distorting kind of effect. And uh, the one thing I wanted to emphasize here is that I'm sure if you look at this list of titles, there are many U.S. periodicals from this time period that you would want to be in there, and I would too, but it's based on the availability in the database that I have. Uh, did I skip my... So what I wanted to do is model two different kinds of change over time and see where they intersected. Uh, both of them, I'll talk about the models in a second, have similar approach. But the idea was to look at the coefficients that are on both of the lists and then uh, do some qualitative coding of the terms to see if I could identify categorizations. And then uh, with the second half of the data set to do some kind of confirmatory test comparing the identified feature families. And I wanted in particular to have a method that could help me discover related words that were not actually uh, identified in the process. And uh, the reason being, uh, many of these approaches, uh, while excellent, often have to have the caveat of we started with assumptions about what the categor dominant category terms might be, and then look to see if they were there. Uh, that has the downside of it doesn't become a way of discovering category terms that you didn't know about or didn't think about. 
So the first model models on one review and how many times or like the uh, uh, relative frequency of a term in that review to predict its date. So the graphic shows the idea of it. If a word like fiction shows up once in a review in 1908, tends to show up twice in 1915 and th many more times in 25, this would discover the word fiction as a predictor of a later date, right? And of course, it never works this cleanly. You'll never find a term that looks that clear, but this is the example to show that the unit of analysis is one review and we're looking for coefficients that predict the date, uh, an earlier date or a later date. The second model was also a bag of words model, but what I did is I bootstrapped uh, s little samples of collections of book reviews and I looked for how many of them contained a term. So what this does is it controls for one review that has many, many, many references to the same word. And it's just looking for, does that word spread in diffusion over time or shrink in diffusion over time? And so as you can see, if I grabbed a sample and fiction is only in one of four reviews, then it's in, on average two, then three, and on and on, this would discover fiction as a predictor of uh, the later date uh, based on that document frequency. Okay, so here are the results of the two models. I just want, I don't need to go into this in detail, but it was important for me to just show that these are actually doing, an R squared of 0.21 is not a great score, but it's just saying, uh, if you're trying to guess the year of a book review just on these term frequencies, you're capturing about 20% of the variance in that prediction, which for this task, which I consider fairly difficult, I think that's pretty good. And uh, about two thirds of the predictions, the guess is within five years. So uh, I did all the normal standard parametric validations for linear regression. Ask me about that in the Q&A. Um, the second model has an extremely high R squared score, but if you think about it, it's based on bootstrap data, so it's basically impossible for it to not be much better, right? It, has, it will have to perform better mathematically. So its R squared score is 99% of the variance, and 67% of the data is within 0.35 years of the true publication year. Uh, again, though, it validates, so the, the issue here is the task is just easier when you have many reviews, which is interesting, I think. So I went on to just look at what the uh, coefficients were that overlap. Uh, the way this is done is like set some kind of a cutoff, like two, for me it was 2,000 or 4,000. Uh, and it's just how many words are uh, on both lists at the very top rank, right? So if, it's, if I do the cap of 2,000, uh, a word could be number one on one list and number 900 on the other, but as long as it's on both, it counts. And I found words that uh, seem to suggest categories that I was interested in. And I, I did a small set and then did a kind of revise and recode, but I won't say much about that now. I found predictors of an earlier date like PPCO volume net cloth that I called basically medium specific. They're about books as objects, or as you'll see, non-books as objects as well. Genre, uh, romance, companion, artist, gossip, Judgment, words like clever, merit, evident. Now, it should be clear that these are decontextualized, so we don't know if they're actually meaning those things. The idea was to look for things that uh, could shape a hypothesis, not to say that this is the conclusion. Later date, uh, as you see, uh, movie, but books would qualify as a medium term. Read, perform, performance, newspaper, and program. Things that, again, they're not all books, but they're all physical manifestations. Uh, genres like the word tribute, propaganda, journalism, Victorian poetry, they aren't exact, a lot of these are not a genre in and of themselves, but they're evocative of genre choices, I think. And then you have a word like thrill, I'll get to this later, but obviously that, there's a certain amount of um, interpretive uh, just judgment call being made here. One of you might have put thrill in genre because of the idea of a thriller, for example. Uh, just to try to validate and triangulate that the terms I was finding had something to do with each other at all, I ran a topic modeling scenario and, found, and derived topic, uh, topics that, uh, just to see if words that I had tagged similarly also co-occurred with each other. And I, I just am showing some examples here where the drama ones definitely cluster, the art and artist ones definitely cluster, 
there's a strong uh, topic for uh, words that seem to evoke the physicality of a book, like edition, illustration, and page. Uh, poetry, a uh, category for novel, fiction, novelist, story, writer. Music, another one here that is evocative of a uh, physical object of a book. And then one here that seems to suggest uh, children's fiction, as, or just children's readership. Uh, I did do a model coherence assessment just to make sure that none of those models were thought to be like these awful outlier models that have no coherence, and that none of the low coherences were affiliated with the uh, signal of these uh, feature families that I was identifying. And there was one, so I excluded it. Uh, it, was, it started book, mister, author, reader, volume, and it just ha there happened to be other uh, topics that also had some of those words that were just much more coherent, so I used those instead. Uh, the judgment terms really didn't show up in their own topics, but seemed to be mixed in with genre and medium terms. And uh, the most coherent topics overall are not on this, but they were the ones that you would expect to be associated with content, like uh, German, Germany, von, Hungary, Turkish, Turkey. I don't know what that's about. I don't know what any of those words mean. Uh, and voice, Sir Clark, Oliver, psychic, hand, spirit, which is an interesting thing to, if someone else wants to investigate what that is. Uh, the hypothesis that I wanted to set up here was uh, I wanted to evaluate the relative coherence of these different feature families. Which ones seem to be most coherently changing over time as a set? Uh, medium terms, genre terms, judgment terms. My prediction was that medium and genre features would be more predictive, and that was partly based on the topic modeling because the judgment terms didn't co-occur with each other. Uh, I figured, oh, maybe that's because these judgment terms are idiosyncratic, like just this one word is changing over time. The way we call something good is changing over time. So I used an approach that I think is really exciting and interesting, and I would urge others to look into it if they're interested. Uh, it's called word movers distance, and the idea of it is instead of doing a bag of words approach, which only can find that exact word, or if you do lemmatization, anything that's lemmatized that way, this uh, uses a uh, word embeddings approach to uh, rank the similarity of document one to document two based on the shortest possible path in the word embedding space between document one and document two. And in this example, this is from the canonical paper on word movers. Uh, the sentence, Obama speaks to the media in Illinois and the president greets the press in Chicago with a bag of words model would have a similarity of zero because it has no words in common. With a Doctivec, it would have a much higher similarity, right? But then you would learn nothing about why. You would just be able to say they're very similar. And the word movers distance tries to get all the best of Doctivec with the interpretability of Obama transforms to president, speaks transforms to greets, Chicago to Illinois media press, right? And then you get this interpretable list of the moves that informs the distance. Uh, in reality, this works it's much more complicated than that. Uh, they deliberately chose an example where there's a one-to-one -one of words. You're looking at the relative frequency of the words, so we have to figure out how to move 0.13 of the word anticipation to destinations uh, in the second document, so we move 0.05 of it to the word cather and 0.08 of it to the word effective. Uh, the two sentences here I didn't read out loud, but you're welcome to check out my slides online and, and actually look at all of this. I don't want to go into it so much. I just wanted to point out that you can get this. And as the documents get longer, this list gets much longer, obviously. So this becomes an object that you also have to analyze. So I adapted this slightly because that is a document to document similarity score and I needed features for a regression. So what I did is I created this method called uh, word mover similarity centroid regression. It's, it's similar to what some other people have done with a, s a couple of slight tweaks. Uh, when you take a sentence like Cather's, uh, uh, any book of Miss Cather's is long awaited and expectantly tasted in anticipation, and word movers transport it to the word novel, there's only one possible transport path, and it is the shortest distance. And that becomes a score that we can use as a feature to think about how that sentence or a book review, how strong of a, word, of a novel score it has. But if it has more words that are similar to the word novel, it will be more similar. So uh, 
what we want to do is basically get a bunch of these centroid signposts and use those as features to try to predict the date. And then once we have done that, look at all the other words that predicted that date other than the, word, the seed word novel. What were the nearest neighbors that helped predict it in the actual corpus? So here's what happened. Uh, I identified the feature family terms. There's a couple, uh, 280 terms, and then some of them get called out, so it goes down to about 240. It uh, has an R-squared score of 255 and an adjusted R-square of 1.197. Uh, and it has a mean absolute residual of four, meaning, uh, in this case, about 62% of the predictions are within five years. It validates, and so we've gone from having 40,000 features with an uh, adjusted R-square score of negative, you know, basically zero, as close to zero as you can be, uh, to having a ro fairly robust adjusted R-square with m uh, less than 250 features. So uh, then we... Uh, actually do uh, confirmatory testing on genre, medium, and judgment feature families separately, and we can compare both the R-squared scores and the adjusted R-squared scores. This is on a partition data set, so there's no issues of like uh, p-hacking or anything, and so I am actually, uh, here I'm, I'm reporting R-squared and adjusted R-squared, and then with coefficient analysis, I'm actually looking at p-values as well. But the hypothesis that genre and medium terms would be more predictive than judgment terms was pre-registered with the Open Science Framework, and uh, what we found instead, uh, I found instead, is, uh, as you can see, the, the adjusted R-square is the one we want to look at because that balances against the total number of features. And the uh, medium terms are the most predictive of the date of the review. Uh, that's what's changing the most over time. And then judgment actually beats out genre, but just narrowly. Uh, and of course, judgment terms don't have to be co-occurring and coherent for this to happen. But with this being this close, we might want to interpret this as something closer to a tie, probably. So, uh, I promised that because I'm using this uh, word movers, you can actually look at the composition of the uh, centroid. And so this is an example of one of the medium signposts. Uh, we have um, words like uh, net, quarto, cloth, pp, meaning pages, film, play, performance. Uh, these are their coefficients. This is the standard error and the p-value. These are ones with especially low p-values, but I'm also looking at the coefficient because that tells you how large the effect size is. And then this graph to the left is uh, looking at a signpost uh, for the word document. And what I've done, this is barely a graph, but it's designed to show you what the composition of the centroid for the word document is made up of. So. Uh, document has the shortest path to document because it's zero, but there are many, many more occurrences of the word book that actually feed into this feature. That's what that's showing you. Is that clear? Ask me about it later if you have, have follow-up. But genre signposts, we see things like comedy, terror, Victorian. Uh, those predict a later date. Dedicatory, stories, document, plot, and sequel predict earlier. And then I just showed the word plot again as another example where you can see it starts with the word plot, but words like scene and tragedy actually feed into the centroid. So again, this, what I like about this method is it gives us the opportunity to be surprised because you might have thought plot was more likely to be associated with fiction, and here it's actually more associated, it looks like, maybe uh, with plays. We'll see. Uh, judgment signposts. This one is my favorite example because it starts with the word unfortunately, which I coded as a judgment because it's hard to say unfortunately and think something positive. But the words that feed into it are words like yet and indeed and although and apparently and seldom, and these are all predictors of an earlier date. So it, this is maybe in part explaining why judgment terms have a higher predictive power than I thought they would. These are hedge words, right? And there's a, you, we almost can associate this with Earlier date of book review equals kind of hedgier, more, I don't know, uh, quote unquote gentlemanly in their discourse. And then other uh, coefficients there that either predict an earlier date or a later date. So lastly, uh, medium feature family appears to be most cogent in predicting the year review was published. Judgment feature family narrowly outperforms the genre. Medium and judgment both seem to be entangled with judgment, but maybe not as much with one another. Right? We don't see as much overlap of medium and genre. 
Uh, this could help inform prior work on genre di differentiation, some of which uh, was authored by Ted Underwood, who's here. Uh, we may want to, uh, they look at fairy tales for their like historical uh, coherent score. And uh, just thinking about what would happen if you did the difference between fairy tales and children, it may not make a difference, but it could be interesting. I'll let them decide. Uh, thrillers and comedies might be suggested as genres that aren't uh, as likely to be cataloged as such by librarians. And uh, obviously we could adapt this method to discover other genres because we can do this in a, uh, a more agnostic way. Um, lastly, I'm wondering now if radio and movies helped generate some market genres because I, I think there's some uh, literature on this, but uh, there's some suggestion that the word thrill at least is associated with movies in this. And, um, and then uh, there's some prior scholarship on uh, the idea of this entanglement of judgment with genre, and uh, just kind of thinking of that as changing over time as well. Does the entanglement itself change over time? So next steps, there are many, and I probably won't have time to do all of them, but uh, I would like to just isolate the actual fiction in here, or maybe even like subgenre, because I really didn't see any signs of like science fiction, romance, uh, romance novel, Western, et cetera. Uh, additional kind of fix effects or like subsampling by the metadata in it. Um, how uh, the vocabulary of reviews relates to or is similar to the actual text, the full text of the text it's reviewing. And then uh, there's a whole bunch of applications of this word movers for classification and regression, I think. So to conclude, whether signifying zeal, disdain, or admiration, the worth conveyed by book reviews is often worth by association. Thank you. So uh, I think we have time for like two questions if they're of a technical kind of, or do you, you know, clarifying nature, and then Q and A at the end. But if anything's unclear, I also shared the link to my slides, so you're welcome to look. And if not, I will uh, take that to mean I did an amazing job. <laughs> Matt, Matt, could just explain a little bit more what, what you're doing in using word movers to sort of coalesce features uh, around a single, the, the point there is to, is it to reduce the dimensionality of your model, is that? It's a, it, it reduces the dimensionality of the model much like PCA, but when you do PCA, it is, based on eigenvector centrality, so you don't have any control about what gets lumped together. You can look at the loadings of PCA, but you can't change them. This will uh, load them together based on how close they are to each other in the, in the word mover space. And then I set a cutoff, so I did N25, so it won't include in the composition, this is an arbitrary choice and I wanna do more just investigating the other options, but the idea is you don't want the, uh, distance or similarity score to be overly influenced by all of the other words in the document that have nothing to do with it. That's the logic. I just had a question about your journal selection. Um, you said you picked 10 from a database. You listed some exclusions, but was there any reason, I mean, were, they, were these the only 10 that remained after the exclusions, or how did you choose these particular 10 apart from needing to have enough reviews in each one? Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, it's basically, I applied certain controls, and once that had been done, there were a few left that maybe would have like 12 reviews in them, but I excluded things where there were just far too few to be helpful as well. Uh, certainly could be worth adding those back in for the uh, ex for the final uh, kind of um, composition. But yeah, it, you know, as so many of us are just limited by the, um, the you know, prior assumptions made by ProQuest, essentially. One more, and then we'll move on. Uh, one, one quick question. Uh, can you tell me uh, how you calculate your topic coherence score, which measure you used, and did you also use a reference corpus maybe? Uh, for this, I just used this, like the boilerplate. Um, it's basically the same as the default one in Mallet. I did it in Python, but it's like, uh, I have the full detail in my paper, but it's um, uh, PMI of the top, uh, either 20 or 25 words, 
and then um, just the PMI score of every one of those words to every other one of those words. So you do all, all the possible pairs and get a coherent score. And um, again, the N there is a little bit arbitrary, right? But it's just, it's basically designed to just find the absolute worst topic models and discard them, which I did. Okay, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We're gonna go on to uh, Melanie Walsh and Maria Antoniak who are participating remotely. Hi everyone, we're very sad that we couldn't be in Austria with you this week, but we're grateful for your time and attention and we're happy that we can contribute through, through this video. So a lot of our collaborative research that we've done in the last several years has been focused on online reading communities and online book reviews and what we can learn through this kind of reception evidence and this kind of online data um, about the contemporary reception of literature and also about how these communities are functioning and how they're creating new ideas, um, such as new ideas about genre. So to do this work, we've been synthesizing approaches and scholarship from the humanities with approaches and scholarship from um, information science and lots of the conference venues um, that come along with uh, information science and information an information science program is actually where Marie and I first met. So we're going to share some findings from our research with a particular focus on kind of this generative interplay between the digital humanities and information science. So we thought we would begin with um, our particularly illustrative review um, that demonstrates some of the possibilities and challenges um, that this kind of reception evidence poses, and in particular, the opportunities and challenges that scholarship in information science settings can help us address. We also just love this review. So this username Bren says, I did not like Lolita, I am giving Lolita a two. I am just now writing this even though I read it some time ago. This review is inspired by some of my GR friends whose fearlessness about giving low stars to books they do not like has inspired me to change my rating of Lolita from three stars to two stars, as that is what I really feel. I could not read the whole thing. I struggled. I get that this is a classic and book snobs who read this will sigh in indignation, but I do not care. Um, so there's a lot going on here, right? Um, so one, uh, Goodreads users are influencing Bren and, and uh, influencing her to change her review. So one of the things we're interested in is that kind of influence, both from other users in the community and from the Goodreads algorithm or the UX design. Additionally, we're interested in these tags that you can see at the top of the review, um, where she's tagged this book as a classic, for example. Um, and then finally, we're interested in user privacy and attribution. So how do we talk about this kind of, re of a review in a presentation or in published scholarship? So these are all kinds of uh, problems or opportunities that, again, information science has been really helpful um, for us in terms of, of thinking through, um, particularly thinking about ethical approaches to internet data or social media data um, and theories of online communities and the way that communities function and evolve. Um, so like I said, both of us uh, have experience in information science programs. I'm currently a professor in, the, in an information school and a lot of people um, increasingly um, in the digital humanities community have some ties to uh, information science. And we are by no means the first people who are talking about this really generative relationship in fact, there was a whole special issue of JSIS about, about this very interplay and an and article in particular called Digital Humanities in the iSchool. So I would definitely recommend reading that special issue and reading that article to learn more. But again, we're going to be presenting some findings from our kind of reader focused research um, with an eye toward, toward this relationship. So one of the big projects that we worked on in the last several years was um, analyzing Goodreads reviews of classic books. And we were particularly interested in what people were tagging as classics, what they, what they think of as classics, as well as you know, why people love the classics and why people hate the classics because they love and hate them quite, quite a lot. Um, so to do this work, we collected more than 120,000 reviews of about 150 top classic books. And we analyzed them with 
several different approaches and from several different angles. So for example, we were able to show that kind of surprising to us, um, most of the classic books that uh, Goodreads users are interested in skew toward the 19th century and the 20th century, and they overlap quite considerably with what we would think of as the canon and with um, English curriculum from high schools and colleges. Uh, additionally, we were able to use approaches from natural language processing, such as topic modeling, to get a broad understanding of the themes and topics that were often coming up in users' reviews, such as the fact that they were talking about high school and college a lot, the fact that they had read these books in those kinds of environments, or they hadn't read those books and they were returning to read something that they had never been assigned in, in high school. Um, we were also able to detect a lot of different writing styles in these reviews. And then beyond the topic modeling and the natural language processing, we were also able to think about these reviews from even different angles, um, such as again, returning to that example of the user Bren and how people were influencing her understanding of Lolita. We were interested in how the default sorting algorithm from Goodreads was shaping users' reviews. For example, one finding was that, um, you, that reviews that were showing up in the default sorting algorithm had the word update in the review more often. So um, when it was showing up in this default setting, uh, users were be, you know, being motivated to go back and change their reviews, much like Bren, you know, whose review was getting more engagement, was, was getting more attention from her friends, was inspired to change her review. And this is an example, I think, of um, you know, a kind of a, a kind of problem space that uh, people in information science programs um, or with information science backgrounds are also thinking about and can be really helpful interlocutors for, for thinking through. I'm going to share some other work in this vein. So moving from a single tag, the classics, to many different tags and mapping those tags or genre labels in relationship to each other. So we were thinking about who decides how to organize genres. We know, or at least there's prior work on how literary critics, academics, publishers, and authors think about genre. But what about people in online reading communities like Goodreads or Library Thing, another website that's very similar to Goodreads? And how do non-traditional genres like vampires, which is a very popular genre on Goodreads and Library Thing, stand in relation to traditional genres? And how are online genres related to offline organization of books? So again, there's lots of prior work um, around genres and mapping genres and what are genres. So literary scholars has emphasized, for example, that genres are blurry, change over time and depend on context. And computational studies have focused on genre classification, especially of book length texts. Um, and while we're similarly focused on genre definition, similarities and boundaries, we're focused on user reviews and tags. And our goal is not to predict the correct genre label, um, but to learn from users about how genres are understood and used in an online community. Um, and one place where we're really drawing on our setting when we were writing this within an info side department was drawing inspiration from a community called um, CSCW, um, Computer Supportive Cooperative Work. It's a big conference that happens every fall. Um, and there's a line of work at that conference and in related conferences and venues um, especially back in the day around folksonomies and tagging systems. And so Library Thing and Goodreads, um, both of these online reading websites, allow users to tag books with free text fields. And those tags can be used as all kinds of things because they're just free text. You can write whatever you want. So they can be personal categories, community rankings, genres, all kinds of things. And that fits the definition of a folksonomy. So unconstrained tags, rather than rigid hierarchies or taxonomies, applied by individuals and communities. And despite that unconstrained nature of the tags, they still result in usable systems. And so in the case of library thing, those tags that the users are applying, those free text tags are used by library thing to make money um, by selling a catalog system to small libraries and bookstores to organize their physical spaces of books. Um, we're also interested in this interplay between downstream and upstream research settings. So in the downstream setting, uh, we might clean the genre tags, create a non-overlapping taxonomy, and use that taxonomy to train a classifier. 
Um, so the tags are just used for this classifier. Um, whereas in the upstream setting, we can use that messy collaborative genre, those genre tags to interrogate the label definitions and really like lean into that unconstrained nature of this folksonomy tagging system. Um, and, uh, I'll just mention that, yeah, downstream and downstream and upstream are natural language processing terms. And this is something that Maria would often talk about to me and she'd be like, oh, you're interested in like the upstream kind of implications of this work. And I would be like, Am I? I guess I am. And yeah, that was like another way in which this interdisciplinarity was really generative. And exploring these genre tags with that upstream setting, we're also learning about how people experience literature individually and in this online community. We collected a bunch of data from library things, similar to the data we collected from Goodreads. Um, and what question we were interested in in both these settings, where again, our info size setting helped us a lot, was in the data ethics. So should we treat these reviews as private data or public data or something in between? Um, and the challenge here was that reviewers share very personal information, political opinions and stories, but they also often view their reviews as professional work and even sign with their um, real name sometimes. Um, replicating the text of the reviews, like if we just replicated all the texts, um, would remove their ability to edit, update, or delete their reviews and like maintain their own privacy if they wanted. But on the other hand, if we just um, like anonymize the reviews, like included the text, but remove their names, that would remove their credit as artists. So we drew on a lot of work, again, from CSCW and from related venues um, to think this problem through. And we decided to contact all reviewers whom we directly quote and ask their preferences. Including Bren, who wrote that hilarious takedown of Lolita. So in this work, we were interested in how to map and measure genre, how much overlap of books and users is there between genre pairs, how distinctive are the review texts for a genre, and how similar are the tagging habits of a genre's reviewers. So just to give you one bit of a result from this paper, um, which we actually ended up publishing at CSCW, and I invite you to read, um, one thing that we looked at was a comparison between book overlap. So if we have two genres like graphic novel and classics, they might have very low book overlap, but they might have high user overlap. There might be a lot of people who enjoy reading and reviewing both graphic novels and classics. And we can plot these two things against each other. So here I'm showing a figure where we compare the book and user overlap for each pair of genres in our data set. So the x-axis is showing the user overlap while the y-axis is showing the book overlap. And as expected, the book overlap and user overlap are correlated. So if two genres share a lot of books, they also are likely to share a lot of users. However, we find some interesting outliers. So for example, humor and picture book and fantasy and picture book um, have relatively high book overlap, but relatively low user overlap. Perhaps picture book reviewers read more frequently in other genres and only occasionally tag a picture book, for example, when they give the book as a gift. Whereas other gaps help to reveal meaningful connections between genres and identify subcommunities that straddle multiple genres. So for example, memoir and crime have relatively few books in common, but they share a lot of users. And that kind of makes sense to me. Um, the low book overlap seems to indicate that users draw a clear distinction between these two genres. Memoir and crime are not the same thing. Nevertheless, these genres share many reviewers, cluing us into reader interests that span different genres. So in this work, um, we found that genres differ by their surprisal, by reviewer homo homogeneity, by topics. You can read all about this in the paper. Um, and we found that freeform tagging gives individuals creative license to diverge from traditional catalogs. And Goodreads and Library Thing both help shape literary reception, and reviewers' tags are directly shaping your own bookstores and libraries. And now I'm going to touch on some of our current work that we're really excited about. This is something uh, we're working on this summer. Uh, so in these book reviews, here's a review by Lily Wren for, in a review of Flowers of Algernon. Many different aspects of the book and the author and the reader experience are touched on. Like here, Lily Wren is discussing character, plot, writing style, um, emotional response, genre, whether this fits in a genre or doesn't, and these kind of big themes about humanity. So touching on many different themes, and these themes might differ depending on the genre of the book. So we're interested in labeling aspects in book reviews. And here we're drawing on both natural language processing and data science and venues like ICWSM, venues that are interested in the internet and online communities. 
um, where aspect det detection is a standard task for extracting the features of a product from its reviews. This is usually about like Amazon products, like for phones and cameras and stuff. But here we're thinking about in the context of book reviews. So our goal is to identify fine grained aspects of book reviews. And another way to think about that is what values are these reviewers expressing in their online book reviews and how do those values vary across genres? Um, so we spent a lot of time, I mean, we're like years into this project off and on, um, where Melanie and I have spent a lot of time developing a code book for these fine brain, fine grain aspects. And in this process of code book development, we're drawing a lot from different disciplines, um, especially from these more qualitative disciplines that we've been exposed to in the info size setting. So again, going back to CSCW and also venues like CHI, so human computer interaction, where this kind of code, de code book development and the process for this is standardized. We've found um, 37 fine grained aspects used in these online book reviews, and we've annotated a set of 400 sentences with the most frequent of these reviews, and we're still working on finishing the annotation. So these, um, I'm not going to go into all of them because there's a lot, but they fall into broad categories, these different aspects. So some of them are about the book, like the writing style, humor, suspense, pace, characters, while others fall into, for example, um, aspects about the artifact, so illustrations in the book, context around the book, so um, about the author, about adaptations, like movie adaptations of the book, and then also about the reviewer and their own like emotional response and feeling of engagement with the book. Um, here I'm just showing a little piece of that code book, some example um, reviews and also like definitions that we've come up with. Um, and so this will all be part of that final code book. And here just a snippet of results from uh, some of the most frequent aspects that we've labeled so far. So here are five of those aspects, author, characters, genre, plot, and verdict. And we're showing how frequently those aspects are mentioned across um, a set of 20 genres. So we can see that, for example, genre itself, people, these online reviewers are more likely to mention the genre of the book in books that fall within children's, Christian, mystery, and young adult genres. And that's we're much more to come on this project, but we wanted to give you a teaser. Uh, so in conclusion, online reading platforms like Goodreads or Library Thing are incredibly exciting and incredibly rich for studying reception, readers, contemporary literary culture. They're really exciting for the digital humanities. Um, and work from information science venues or scholars has been totally transformative for our scholarship and our work um, in this area. I was trained in an English department and before joining an information science program, I had never even heard of CSEW. I barely even knew how to read um, a paper from CSEW, but it was completely related to all of the things that I was thinking about. And um, yeah, it's just been a real boon for, for me and for our work. Um, and we haven't even touched on all of the many contributions that digital humanities scholars can also make and have already made in these uh, areas as well. So we just wanted to highlight that we think this is a, a really productive interplay, um, particularly for uh, the study of readership and reception in this contemporary moment, but also for all kinds of work. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. We have another remote presentation coming up next, Yurong Hu, and um, they're setting it up behind me, I believe. So uh, I just want to mention, um, so far at least, uh, Maria and um, Melanie have not been able to get into the app. And um, so if you have questions for them, uh, I would still ask them, because I think they'll be able to watch the video at least, and um, I would just urge people to communicate with them individually. But um, hopefully they will, uh, as they have already been, uh, continue to be a presence here in our thought, if not in our actual uh, conference. So uh, are you ready for the next one? All right, thank you.
Hi everyone, thanks for joining our panel. Um, it's a pity that I can only join you remotely, but I sincerely hope you enjoy our, our panelist presentation and discussions as much as I do. My name is Yue Ronghu. I'm a PhD candidate at the School of Information Sciences, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Today my presentation is about comparative and cross-cultural study of online book reviews. Um, more specifically, it's a case study of uh, top books curated by users on Douban based in China and how these books were uh, rated across Douban and Goodreads. Before I officially start my presentation, I would like to mention that the work I'm presenting today is based on my thesis work as well as uh, research collaborations with my committee members and co-authors. Um, the presentation today involves work associated with our published and incoming papers, and here they are. Um, I would like to express my gratitude to my team uh, and, and acknowledge their work. First, background of this project. Um, in the last two decades, as uh, our panelists have discussed, empirical studies of online book reviews have opened up a lot of new research opportunities and advanced our understanding of a lot of things such as books, reader communities, reader behavior, literary genre, literary history, etc. However, existing works remain um, quite Western and Anglophone focused to the detriment of other perspectives. For instance, here we'll list a few of the most frequently cited and leveraged data sources, as well as book impact indicators that are often used with this online book review data sources. Um, so we can tell, like in existing research, the books that have been intensively studied are mostly books with distinguished popularity, commercial success, and prestige in the Anglophone world. Reciprocal effects and multiplier effects have emerged from this limited scope of research, where various book review platforms, booksellers, and book impact indicators seem to echo each other's opinions and endorse the same group of bo groups of books. And these books might be subject to historical and social culture biases, as many DH research uh, has pointed out. So motivated by this gap and inspired by other DH colleagues' work on culture diversity in DH, this project aims to create a parallel data set of both non-anglophone and anglophone book review data for comparative analysis. We hope this data set will enable us to uh, explore a set of questions on book review data sets uh, in culture dimension. For instance, how are the user curated top books on one platform rated on another? Uh, for instance, what are the most rated, most shelved and top rated books on Douban? And how are these books uh, reviewed or rated on Goodreads and vice versa? Uh, and how do book reviewers' interests and opinions uh, differ by their linguistic and the geographical backgrounds? Uh, and also as researchers, how might researchers curate data collected from different platforms for better cross-culture comparisons, particularly when the data is in different languages? And finally, how culture-dependent or platform-dependent is the online book review data? And how might uh, these dependency affect the research findings? The expected contributions are also listed here. First, we would like to expand and diversify existing research, which is primarily Western and Anglophone focused. We also want to advance our understanding of online book review data sets in cultural dimension. And finally, we hope uh, our data set would uh, help us create a data curation workflow or pipeline in support of more comparative and cross-cultural studies. Um, for this parallel data set, we collected Anglophone book review from Goodreads based in the US and now Anglophone data from Douban based in China. This table here introduces and compares the two platforms. While both platforms are pretty impactful among their user communities with um, very large use bases, their major differences lie in their coverage of items, um, primary language of content, uh, and their commercial dependencies. But most importantly, uh, with existing research data, we confirmed that Douban and Goodreads user communities are significantly different in terms of their users, uh, geographical and the linguistic backgrounds, uh, which make them suitable for cross-cultural uh, comparisons. Um, in terms of books to include in this parallel data set, we decided to start from uh, the Douban books. 
and in particular, we use the most rated and discussed books on Douban, uh, for they are more likely to be underrepresented in existing studies, and therefore more likely to bring us new insights. Uh, we managed to curate a longitudinal data set of the Douban top 250 book lists from 2011 to 2021. Um, here's the screenshot of the list, which presents uh, real-time rankings, average ratings, and numbers of ratings of the uh, 215 most popular and highly rated books on Douban. Uh, this list is based on cumulative and crowd ratings and reviews on Douban, uh, and is moderated by uh, Douban algorithms. Uh, the data set we put together includes metadata rankings, ratings, number of ratings, number of reviews, and tags for each book listed. Um, in total, this longitudinal data set pointed us to 552 unique books on Douban uh, that had been on this top 250 uh, book lists through the decades. Next, we searched for these um, top Douban books on Goodreads. This um, seemed to be a very straightforward task, um, and at first we thought we could do it you know, computationally, but in fact it turned out to be much more complex. For instance, um, through our preliminary investigation into the information organization and bibliographic control on Doba and Goodreads, we found that both platforms were unable to correctly identify or aggregate or the uh, different editions, volumes uh, of the same works. Although Goodreads seems to have this aggregation function, it doesn't work with many of the Douban books that we are interested in. For instance, the screenshots here show how we searched for the same book called Di Luxiang, which was written in Chinese by Zhang Ailing on Douban and Goodreads. On the left, we can see that uh, when searching for this book on Douban, uh, the website uh, does not uh, aggregate the, the ratings and reviews for the same work. Uh, it lists the uh, different editions or volumes uh, as separated, distinct works. Uh, meanwhile, on Goodreads, at first, we searched for Di Luxiang, the book title, in Simplified Chinese, but uh, nothing was returned. Uh, so we tried the title in traditional Chinese, uh, and there was one book in Chinese returned. Uh, then we searched for the book in English, uh, hoping that this would return more data since it's in English. However, this time also only one book was returned, and this one returned was a book in English, which was different from the uh, previous one we got with the uh, traditional Chinese title. So in short, um, varied queries uh, led to non-overlapping and non-aggregated works on the reads. Therefore, uh, comparisons of complete sets of the same work across Goodreads and Douban are impossible. So we decided to compare the single most rated edition of the same work across the two platforms instead. Uh, and due to the searching and matching complexities we just saw here, uh, we manually searched for the web pages for the most rated or the most rated or the most reviewed copies of the top Doban books on Goodreads, and we manually cleaned and paired the data across the platforms, which explains why this data is relatively small uh, in terms of size. In addition to the effectiveness and the completeness of the searches by metadata, metadata quality is another big concern. Um, here are two more examples showing us the necessity of manual data checking, cleaning, and validation. Uh, on both Dova and Goodreads, we often run into cases like these where book B's metadata was assigned to book A's web page. Um, based on our experience with online book review data, metadata errors are pretty common. Uh, some of them are data mismatches that are apparent for our human reader to identify, uh, like the ones listed here. Uh, however, some are more nuanced and complex, and the latter often requires reference checking or domain knowledge in areas uh, like bibliography or book history to resolve. Um, so with a lot of manual work, we managed to uh, pair uh, 537 pairs of books across uh, Doba and Goodreads. Our preliminary comparisons of their data um, have uh, several interesting findings. Uh, first, in terms of overall book ratings, uh, book, uh, Doba and ratings are 
relatively higher than Goodreads ratings, uh, regardless of the original languages of the books or the culture background of the books. Uh, however, books on Goodreads received far more ratings than books on Douban. For instance, uh, here we can see that um, Douban, on average, these books get uh, 63,000 ratings, uh, while on Goodreads, these books, on average, got uh, around 2 million ratings. However, there were some exceptions, and the exceptions are mostly books that are originally published in Chinese and Japanese. Uh, these books have received uh, millions of ratings on Douban, but got very limited attention on Goodreads. For instance, here uh, we list the top 10 Douban books that were originally published in Chinese. Uh, they only received hundreds and thousands of reviews on Goodreads, which is way lower than the Goodreads average, which is 2 million. In addition, when comparing the cross-platform ratings, we also compared the 1 to 5 star distributions of the ratings with callback Libla divergence, uh, namely KL divergence. We wanted to measure this as well because sometimes books uh, with very similar overall ratings across platforms have very different percentages of 1 to 5 star ratings. Uh, taking Lolita as an example here, this book had very close uh, overall ratings across the two platforms with 3.88 out of 5 on Goodreads and 3.85 out of 5 on Douban. However, if we're uh, taking a closer look into the ratings, we will see that on Goodreads it received 35% of 5 star ratings, which was uh, the highest among all 1 to 5 star ratings and also very uh, positive. It also received 32% of uh, four-star ratings. Meanwhile, on Douban, it received mostly three-star and four-star ratings. Um, in this case, it makes sense to acknowledge the differences in ratings uh, in both their overall ratings and the distributions of ratings. So um, at the bottom here, we visualize the KL divergences uh, of the books uh, grouped by their uh, first publication language. Uh, the languages are Chinese, Japanese, English, and all other languages. Uh, here we can see that overall the distributions in ratings diverged the most on Japanese and Chinese works, with mean divergence values of 0 0.8 and 0 0.6 respectively. The maximum divergence values also emerged from Japanese and Chinese books. Um, it was almost 20 for Japanese works and 14 for Chinese works. Meanwhile, the largest divergence value for English works was only 0 0.5. Uh, so in summary, our analysis shows that Douban and Goodreads overall ratings uh, of the Douban top books are similar, uh, with Douban ratings being slightly higher. Uh, more specifically, the ratings diverged most on non-anglophone works, particularly books that were written in Chinese and Japanese, uh, in terms of total numbers of ratings, as well as distributions of the ratings. Um, in addition to uh, grouping the books by their language of publication, we also look into the groups by genre. For instance, we examined the 141 books tagged as classics among the Douban top books, and we compare them with the 144 Goodreads classics uh, Melanie and Marie identified in their Couch Analytics paper. Um, by the way, many thanks to them for generously sharing this amazing data set. Um, so through comparisons, we find that only 23 works are simultaneously Goodreads and the Douban classics. Uh, other books are either Douban exclusive classics or Goodreads only classics. Um, if you're curious, we listed these 23 shared classics in the middle of this vein graph. Uh, and on the left and right sides are the uh, word clouds of the text users uh, used for tagging classics on uh, Goodreads and Douban respectively. So according to the user tags, words like fiction and literature are frequently used on both platforms. Uh, by the way, the larger the words here, the more frequently they were used for tagging. Uh, however, there were also some interesting differences. Uh, and some genre and theme tags are exclusively used on either Douban or Goodreads. For instance, uh, 
Doban classics include the manga, uh, which is basically graphic novels uh, and comics originated uh, from Japan, and also martial arts works such as the Kung Fu novels by Jin Yong. Uh, while on the reads, uh, there were gothics and dystopia works uh, in the uh, classics. To wrap up, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first computational and comparative case study on a parallel online book review dataset collected from platforms that are primarily English and Chinese to date. Uh, although the dataset is small for now, uh, our preliminary analysis still produced some interesting and promising findings. Meanwhile, it raised even more interesting questions for us to reflect on and further investigate. For instance, um, our data analysis revealed that parallel ratings diverge most for non-anglophone books across platforms, particularly the Chinese and Japanese works that were frequently um, rated on Douban but rarely rated on Goodreads. These findings might not be that surprising, as we all know that Goodreads is a platform rooted in the anglophone world. However, this finding pushes us to think and question how anglophone is Goodreads. If even the most prominent and popular works in Chinese and Japanese were rarely rated on Goodreads, can we use Goodreads data for studying Chinese and Japanese books in general? Does Goodreads have sufficient data about other non-anglophone works and perspectives? If the answer to these questions are mostly negative, can we draw conclusions about word literature, reception theories in general, or literary studies at large with Goodreads data only? Similarly, we also have questions for Douban. What does the convergence of ratings on English works tell us about Douban users? Does it mean that Douban users indeed spontaneously um, appreciated the English books in a similar way as Goodreads users, or their ratings are affected by the reception history of these English canons? To address these emergent questions, more diversified um, data sources are needed. Goodreads' huge and so-called international user base proved to be not that international or diversified. Uh, they might not be able to provide us with sufficient data for non-anglophone books and readerships. Similarly, Douban itself might not necessarily represent all anglophone readerships. So more diversified data sets can be used for not only cross-examining existing findings based on Douban and Goodreads data, but also revealing platform-based biases and limitations of Douban and Goodreads. As we showed in previous slides, we had to manually extract and clean uh, Douban and Goodreads data set a lot due to the limited algorithms uh, and lack of bibliography control, uh, in other words, uh, problematic metadata. So comparative analysis of multi-sourced data might shed light on these issues more effectively. Reflecting on our work so far, we urge DH friends and colleagues to pay more attention to the culture dependencies and the platform dependencies of the research data sets, and also keep diversifying research data sources to achieve broader culture inclusivity and representativeness. We also argue that DH scholars should make more critical use of uh, online book review data in our future work. Here are our references. Um, that's all from my presentation today. Um, thank you so much for your listening. I'm happy to take any questions, and I sincerely hope we could meet in person one day. Yurong is online in the app if you want to post any questions there, and she will respond. And we will uh, move uh, to our final paper with uh, Ted and Wenyi presenting for their group. So first I want to um, thank you all for making your, blasting it out to the very last um, panel and paper in the conference. Uh, thanks also all the organizers, great conference, great venue. 
Um, this is a very collaboratively authored paper. Um, Wenyi and I will be here presenting it, but it benefited from different kinds of expertise from all the authors, information science expertise, but also domain expertise in early 20th century literature. Um, so without further ado, let me go on to um, our basic insight. The insight we're pursuing here is that reception can help us understand literary change. It helps us understand, um, first of all, which innovations get social rewards by looking at how books are engaged with near the time of publication, what, what kinds of prizes or sales they get, we can see what changes from the past to the present have been rewarded. But then further, we can see what social rewards in the present tend to persist into the future. So looking at the whole story, you get a kind of model of literary change, and it's the way that social engagement with literature relates to the changes in the books themselves. I want to stress, though, we're making a predictive associational model, not one that claims to be causal. A causal model of cultural change seems to me still extremely difficult. So when we're, we're going to say um, bestsellers are more similar to the future than they are to the past, typically, we're not necessarily going to claim that's because lots of people read them and they influenced other writers. That's certainly possible, but proving that causal mechanism would be a whole other kettle of fish. We are looking at the early 20th century, as the um, first slide mentioned. Um, let me see if I can go back. Back is hard. Oh, yeah, back, back is hard because I have all these things. Um, we're looking at the early 20th century, 1917 to 1950, because we have lots of evidence about reception in that period and because it's also conveniently far enough in the past for us to talk both about its past and about its future. We can look 25 years in the future beyond 1950 and um, compare reception to change. So, okay, how would we even measure change if we're going to pair reception to evidence about change? We are basically using, borrowing the method from um, Baron Huang, Spang, and Dedeo in 2018, the method they used to talk about change in French revolutionary debate. And their method, in short, is to topic model the speeches of the French Revolutionary Assembly and operationalize change from one speech to another as the KL divergence between the topic distributions of those two speeches. The, the more different their topic distributions are, the more change they see. What's interesting about what they do, and it, uh, I don't think it's really critical that they use kale divergence, as I'll mention in a moment, but what is really interesting and critical is the way they use looking both backwards and forward to think about ch changes that persist, innovations that persist, and to use that as a measure of what it means to be precocious ahead of your time. So for instance, if, if you're the speaker at time J, um, you may be different from the speeches that just preceded you. They call that novelty. You can see in these box plots here that this speech at time J has relatively high divergence from the speeches that preceded it. In fact, more as you go back in time. That's high novelty. It's why the speech is um, sort of outlined by that little square black box on the further left-hand side of the figure. It's why it's sort of far on the x-axis. It's got high novelty. Typically, novelty is going to correlate with, with transience. Changes that are, speeches that are very different from what preceded them are also going to be short-lived. The innovations they introduce don't necessarily last. Like if I say, now it's time for lunch, that doesn't mean we're going to spend the next day talking about lunch. It was a one-off thing. Very different from what came before, but then we're going to go back to some other topic. However, sometimes, like in this case, you have a speech that is different from what came before, but not all that different from what comes after it. It has high novelty, but low transience. Similar, not very different from the future. That's why this um, little black square outlining our, their example speech is below the dashed diagonal line. It has more novelty than you would expect for its relatively low transience. Um, you could call that um, being, we're going to oper operationalize that as precocity. Things that are more similar to the future than they are to the past are precocious. They're ahead of their time. 
So novelty minus transience is the simple measure of precocity we're going to use. So that's how we're going to find out, was the avant-garde ahead of its time? Was it more similar to its future than to its past? They used the word resonance instead of precocity in the 2018 paper. We avoided that because we don't want to imply causality. So resonance seemed to imply like this speech resonated with its audience and therefore persisted. We're just saying descriptively it's more similar to its future than its past. Relatedly, um, relatedly uh, we could, you could ask me questions, I won't go into details, but it doesn't really matter whether you use kale divergence or other measures of distance. They all produce similar results, actually. OK, with that measure of, we're going to apply that measure of precocity. We're going to take it from the context of French revolutionary debate and apply it to the literary marketplace. But the literary marketplace is pretty different from a political debate that takes place in a single room in Paris. Not every, in, in that single room, everyone is presumably hearing every speech. That's really not true of literary history. We do not read all the books in any given year. And when you say a given detective story is innovative, you don't mean that it's very different from all the books in the previous 25 years. You mean it's different from the detective stories. Typically, I think that's what we mean. So comparing each book to all the books that preceded or followed it is arguably not getting at what we really want to talk about with books. And one solution we came up with, and Richard So and I kind of validated this in work on, on 19th century literature in an article two years ago, is to instead compare each book to the 5% of books that are most similar to it in any given year. So we're looking at transience and novelty in the slice of the literary market that is, can be meaningfully compared to the book. Now, 5% is kind of an arbitrary cutoff, but we, we try different cutoffs. And, found meaningful results around 5%. Um, we could, I guess, use genre tags, but uh, I have low confidence that genre tags sort of accurately segment the literary marketplace. Our topic model has 30,000 volumes, so even if we just look at the 5% of most similar books, we end up looking at a large number of, of books in each um, calculation of novelty or transience. We're going to get data about reception from a bunch of places, Pulitzer Prize winners, Nobel Prize winners. We'll have a category of prize winners. Um, we have information about bestsellers drawn from Publishers Weekly through John Unsworth. Thank you, John. Information about book reviews through book review indexes that were compiled by hardworking 20th century people and are preserved in your library in a big wall of book review indexes. That's kind of a gold mine I'm going to show you in a moment. And um, finally, we had sort of our 20, 20th century literature experts mine critical opinions, contemporary critical opinions about the avant-garde, document who said what, and record the authors that they claimed were experimental or avant-garde in the early 20th century. This differs from the other sources of evidence about res reception in being retrospective. It has the advantage of hindsight. These other kinds of information about reception are from a, the few years immediately after a book was published. Just to quickly show you um, how much information is present in book review digests, this is the book review digest which covers the whole 20th century, well, starting around nine, 1915, and it has for each review excerpt an indication of the compiler's estimate of the sentiment of the review, plus, minus, negative, or plus, minus, and minus, plus mean different things, as well as the length of the review, the word count. So we could estimate which books were on average best reviewed, as well as which ones had most said about them, just in terms of the number and the sheer number of words written about them. OK. So I'll briefly explain to our research questions and hypothesis. So um, uh, we get a set of 10 reception measurements listed here and find six of them to be basically independent, and the other four were mostly correlated with some of them. So number nine, I'll briefly go through them. Um, this proportionality in, literary, in little magazines is something directly related to avant-garde. We will not really cover this today. And number 10, later seen as avant-garde, is a retrospective perspective, as we got it earlier here. Um, number four, so we got it manually recognized. And, oh, sorry. 
And number two, most written about we got is from the BRD review here that we calculate with sum up the number of word counts. So not only, uh, so it's, uh, which is basically sum up how long they're reviewed. And number seven, prize winners, a Pulitzer Nobel Prize, we, uh, we mentioned it earlier. Bestsellers, we got it from the answers list, top 10 bestsellers every year. And number three, most positive review, we got it from here, the first one, the sentiment. And for the one that do not have sentiment information, we built a um, sentiment analysis model based on the one do have and use that to um, assume what the sentiment will, it, it will be, whether they're positively reviewed or negatively. Then use this set of sets, the other four, um, by the way, are related to things like uh, how, long, uh, how many reviews they received, but it certainly should be correlated to most written about number two, something like that. And then with this six independently, um, that six variables that we expect to be independent, each of us in our co-author team, there are uh, six, uh, five of us, uh, give a rank uh, of this uh, to, be ex uh, to, to explain how we expect uh, this variable to be related to novelty and uh, um, precautious. For example, for this one, we expect which, uh, which set of reception will reward novelty. We expect, them, for example, number 10, the retrospective avant-garde to be very correlated with novelty. And number three, most positive review to be least correlated with novelty. And for question two, we hypothesize that which site of reception will predict precocity. Then once again, number 10, late retrospective avant-garde, we expect them to be very related to precocity. And number three, to be most uh, positive review, to be le least predictive to precocity. And for question three, we ask, will novelty correlate with precocity? That's basically question one and question two are the two ranks correlated. And although there are only six data points, we do not have statistically significant results, we still find some correlation. For example, number 10 always rank high, and number three always rank low. So basically, we implicitly suggest that novelty correlate with precocity, although the correlation would not be very strong. And question four, are books that get a lot of attention at the time generally ahead of their time? That is, um, for example, number, uh, number, two, uh, number two most written about, number seven prize winners, number eight bestsellers. These are the recognitions in their time. Are these measurements correlated to um, the pre their precocity that are they generally ahead of their time? And we expect they do because we run them high, basically. And I will leave Ted on, take, take on to present the results. So we pre-registered those guesses in the open science framework, um, just to keep us honest. And um, I'm going to start with question, uh, research question four. Is, does attention generally predict that a book is going to be precocious ahead of its time? And the answer is yes. Um, four of the five research reception sites that we've measured so far have significantly above average precocity. The um, strongest is maybe not surprisingly books that contemporary critics think were avant-garde. I mean, of course, critics have the benefit of hindsight. They know like whether some, an innovation persisted or not. So in a sense, this isn't surprising that this has the strongest effect size. But if you do a, a t-test, you compare the mean precocity of the 48 books that we identified as critically identified as avant-garde, yes, there's a, there's a moderately strong difference between it, their precocity and the control group randomly selected from um, the model. Uh, now going to sites of reception that are more contemporary where you don't have the benefit of hindsight, bestsellers were the next strongest um, sort of most precocious books. Then uh, the ones about which most was written. Here we're not looking just at a t-test, a comparison of two means. We're lo looking at Spearman's correlation. So it's sort of like a, a dose response thing. The more was written about you, at least as recorded in Book Review Digest, the more likely a book is to be more similar to the future than the past. Now, again, we don't know whether that means these were influential books, but um, if you got attention, things you did tend to persist. Um, a weaker effect with prize-winning authors, but still a slight tendency for them to be more precocious than average. The one exception is um, getting positively reviewed. That had no association with being similar to the future. In fact, it had a negative correlation. And um, we could talk a lot about why, that we could speculate. We don't really have a, uh, we can't prove why, but one possible reason for this is that some of the most prestigious venues are kind of harsh in their judgment. So getting negative reviews might sometimes be a sign that people are taking you seriously 
and you're being reviewed in the right places. It's not necessarily a bad sign. Um, you could also say there's just no such thing as bad publicity. Um, broadly, our guesses were okay. We, we overestimated how big the effect would be for prize winners, but we got the order of the others somewhat right. In part, this is because there has been some previous work like on 19th century literature um, testing this out. So we had something to go by, but still this is a new period and new evidence about reception. So it's, I think, legitimate validation. We're, we're beginning to have a model of what kinds of reception correlate with literary change, which is nice. Um, however, there are also some things we totally did not expect and um, struggled to understand a little bit. We also thought that being, getting a lot of attention, being a bestseller, at least being widely reviewed, all these things would correlate with novelty. But in fact, the, on average, the books that are, um, say, prize winners or bestsellers have less novelty than the norm for books in our topic model. Um, the one exception is the well-reviewed books, actually. So we're getting just the reverse pattern here. Which, so it's not only that Novelty is not rewarded by reviewers and prize committees, but that our expectation that sort of novelty and precocity would go together is, is totally being overturned here. And um, we struggled to explain this a little bit because, I mean, precocity is novelty minus transience. So more novelty would sort of intuitively help you make innovations that persist, precocity. To help us understand like why this isn't working, let's look at let's visualize the data a little bit so you can see what's what's going on. The red dots here are bestsellers, the blue dots are our control set, and the the y-axis is precocity, the x-axis is novelty. So you can see the our control group includes a lot of books that are just kind of out there. They're doing something that is totally different in some gen generic way than most of the books that are bestsellers. Like it's uh, a book about um, ex you know, heroic war stories of World War I aviation or uh, a book of folklore, Native American folklore. Um, so they're taking risks that make it unlikely for them to become bestsellers. In some cases, they're, they're very similar to the future because aviation turned out to be a thing, but um, by and large, not. As they, by and large, they get less reward if you're not a bestseller, you get less reward for the risk you've taken. You're, the, the risky innovations you make are less likely to persist than the books that are bestsellers. But it's also true that the bestsellers take less risk on average. So they can have less novelty, but more precocity. Okay, I'm gonna just brush through the limitations. I can come back to this slide. If you mention them, I can say, oh, I anticipated that limitation, but there are a lot of limitations among them. You know, lexical models, topic models don't capture everything. You could use embeddings if you had full text. Um, and I wanna end, um, we would like, to, we still have to add evidence about reception in little magazines. And ideally, it would be nice if we had, if anyone knows a good source of Evidence about reception on, say, visual art. I would love to do something similar to this on visual art and then prove that we're not just talking about literature. But um, so open to suggestions. Thank you to Hathi Trust Research Center, without whom we couldn't have extracted all the data from those 20th century periodical indexes, many of which are in copyright. So we had to use a data capsule. So um, since we did a kind of short Q&A just for me, I want to do the same for Ted and Wenyi if we have things of a more technical, let's start there. Or just kind of a shorter question, and then if, if it's a longer one, we'll... I mean, it's not technical, but it's conceptual, but I hope it to be short. Uh, so looking at your scatter plot, uh, I actually suspect you're running into the same problem that stylometrists had for years, which is the interference of different signals, basically, like genre signal, gender signal, whatever else signal within one rather simple measure. I mean, I know it's based on topic model, but still, it's just one measure. It's, in the end, you have two dimensions. 
And I mean, uh, what, do, what do you think of that? So maybe there needs to be a clearer cut corpus. Yeah, I, I agree. We could get rid of the folklore, for instance. I want to go through, I think one of the next steps I don't mention would be go through, really groom our contrast set so that we exclude things that are debatable, like folklore, and also we probably need to manually verify the date, the publication date of everything in the contrast set, because otherwise it's a problem that you know, like if a book is a, won a prize, you kind of know its publication date with greater certainty than you do on average. That becomes a problem for analysis. This is, this is, no, oh, it's not on, okay. This is Idle Curiosity. Which of the books that are retrospectively viewed to be the most avant-garde are least precocious according to your model? So that people looking back say, oh, this mattered, and your model says it doesn't seem to. Oh, you know, that's, some, that's something we should really have for the, for the journal article because people will want to know, but I don't write off that. I, I can look through the data set and tell you afterward, but I don't right off the bat. Um, there was one over here, and then to you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I was just wondering if you could say a few more words on how you calculate the novelty, and the, what did you call it, not persistency, but... Uh, transience. Yeah, the transience. How do you calculate it? So we, we topic model these books, um, it's a little tricky because we want to keep the topic model sort of vanilla. We don't want it to be biased by our inclusion of many, say, bestsellers or well-reviewed books. We topic model one set, and in some cases, we have to extrapolate the topic model using an inference or to books that weren't in the model. But then we measure the, it's Kulbach, Liebler, Leibler divergence between the, the, the topic distributions, like the frequency of each topic in, in each book we, we take that distribution in one book and in another book, we measure the divergence between them. Actually, other measures are fine. It doesn't have to be an information theoretical measure. Um, we use that one because it was used in the Baron et al. paper, but cosine similarity is fine. Mm -hmm. And then I saw, yeah. you want this one? Do it. Uh, Just promise to give it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I th I think I have a technical, not a conceptual uh, question because I just do not understand. Well, I, it's just I'm just continuing the, that the question about topic modeling. So I I understand that topic modeling really helps to find novelty in debates because debates is exchange of ideas. But actually, when you are speaking of topic modeling of books, uh, well. Uh, some some avant-garde novel book can can just be about some kind of ordinary topic, but with some uh, very unusual style or whatever. Conceptually, I mean, yes, and in, indeed, we one of the things we want to do is use embeddings to just to rule out any suspicion that there's some fancy syntax thing that we're not modeling. But in practice, what one finds with topic models is that the uh, the experimental authors do cluster in similar topics. The, the style comes through in, in, in lexical, in word choice. Even though being an experimental author is not a subject like aviation, they still do cluster. And, and just in case anyone's w wondering, any question now is fine. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're open. Yeah. Don't worry if it's technical. Thanks. A wonderful work, and I have a question about um, the measure that you have for, for reception. So like number of reviews, uh, are you taking that, so do you set the limit for when, until when do you take the number of reviews, or do you also consider like, reviews written 10 years after a book is published? We, we just use the ones recorded in Book Review Digest, so, and that's like within a year of publication. Okay, so for all books, more or less, is within a year of publication? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Other questions? I saw a couple hands over here. Hi, yeah, I, I was just, I'm, I'm 
massively impressed by, by this uh, work, all, all of the work. I always uh, get a little nervous when I see these text things. They're so far ahead of us uh, in methods and in, in, in conceptual framing. Um, you mentioned you, uh, well, Ted mentioned you, you, you might be interested in doing something like that on visual art. Um, I would have some immediate suspicion that this period of visual art might not be the best one to try on and, and, and you know, that the relationship between the text that surrounds it um, yeah. is probably much more relevant for, you know, things like the biography of the, the artists. There was some work by Ahmed El Gamal at Rutgers on this kind of time machine, probabilistic um, image novelty measure. So you train a, I think you basically train again until year X and, and see how well it fits the images in year X plus one. Um, have you thought of looking at this, maybe for the, for the whole panel, at um, expanding it to, and we're in Austria, something like 18th, 19th century European tonal music, where you have really strong probabilistic models, um, especially for things like harmonic sequences, right? And, and you can very clearly see that uh, the, the range, the probability distribution of possible tonal shifts gets a little wider gradually as people get more and more used to different things and, and that innovation is I mean, it's a stupid word for it but you see what I mean it might be an easier uh, thing to plug in as a as a non-literary and there might be some some reception too of performances yeah. I guess yeah yeah hugely and then you know the the yeah. directly of, of of the compositions as well even rather than the performances in newspapers and things like this yeah, the, the tough part is the potential gap between the affective response of novelty and the empirical assessment of novelty. Those won't always al align, right? Sometimes there's very little novelty, but it has a very strong feeling of novelty. Mm. And then other times it would register. There, would, I, there could be a bigger gap, I don't know. Mm. Mm. Could be interesting. I think it's a very interesting idea. Ah, over here. This, do you have your hand up too? Uh, thanks for putting together such a really interesting panel with all these pa papers speaking to each other in interesting ways. Um, I guess my question is that with the contemporary papers, there was very much a sort of focus on the idea that there were examinations of the platforms. By contemporary papers, I mean the ones looking at Goodreads. So these are examinations of these social media platforms and the dynamics that occur on them. And then with the historical papers, um, there were sort of comments about, you know, we need to, these are the ones that were available in my library or, you know, we want to look further out. And what I'm interested in is the extent to which people working on the contemporary feel that they are exploring something called literary culture and the people working on the historical think they're exploring something called a platform and like where we're seeing ourselves mm. working based on our historical period. I mean, I think you're right, and I'm guilty of that, of course, especially in this version of it. Uh, and I also just want to say, no, you're, you are correct, though, but I'll assign it to myself. But I just want to share with everyone that I have a 14,000-word uh, draft of this paper that needs to be cut to 8,000 8, words, and so I, I need to do that and then also write a section on what you're talking about. Because it, it's totally true that, like, I'll just name one bias that I'm very aware of with uh, ProQuest, which is uh, periodicals that are... Uh, that are available through ProQuest, chances are they are so because they at some point went bankrupt and they're not a company anymore and so the rights to digitize them became available. Whereas a periodical that started in uh, the 19, early 1900s and is still publishing like the New Yorker or like the, uh, the Curtis publishing company that does sa did Saturday Evening Post is still holding the copyright to that, those are not going to be in ProQuest. So yes, we absolutely have to care about this and I personally, I need to find compelling ways to write about that while I'm also putting in R squared scores and things like that. <laughs> so that's on me. But I don't know if you had any other thoughts. No. And then, yeah. We're coming to the close, so yeah. this maybe has to be the last yeah. question. So thank you very much. Uh, I have two questions to you, Ted and Vinny, and one for Matthew. Um, how how much does it matter to distinct between media and, and genre? Because there are some uh, signposts that mm -hmm. are both from different angles. And uh, since you do not really look into causal factors, 
you might dispense with with this. That, that would be my short question. And did you um, sort out some of the topics um, which may be less informative, or did you just use all the topics? Um, just all of them. Yeah. It's just what Bar Baron et al. did. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential uh, you know, fuzzy edge to the two categories, but for me the distinction as a book historian and someone who cares about bibliography, that is not a distinction I want to abandon, right? If, if, and just from like reading the actual reviews when people talk about it being a fine edition or even like a delicious edition of the book or the beautiful illustrations and the pages, uh, you're right, there are certain words that are at the periphery and one thing I like about this method is if, if you've assumed a word is very clearly in a category. So my example would be um, the word terrific. I coded that as judgment. And uh, the, the associated word movers words are uh, terror and horror and scary. And you go, oh, right, uh, this is 1905. Terrific means scary, not uh, fantastic. So it's actually a clearer uh, signal of the emergent, what becomes called the horror genre. But in the early 20th century, the genre was called terror or weird fiction sometimes, right? So it's actually a, a method that can allow for those serendipitous insights and just, uh, we, we want our models to uh, tell us when we're making um, bad anachronistic assumptions, right? I think that in general is like a good uh, thing. So I think you're right though, that there's a, there's, a, there's a fundamental fuzziness there that has to be acknowledged. I think we're out of time. Uh, We'll be milling around, but thank you all for coming. This was great. Thank you.